Welcome world history students. In this video, I'm going to be going over how to analyze documents with the strategy called hippos. And we're going to use this to understand the enlightenment philosophies that you've been reading about. So by now you should have some background on John Locke and Thomas Hobbes from the class readings and from the profile notes that you took about what they saw, what they thought, and what they said. And so I want you to think just for a second, based on these readings, whose ideas do you agree with most? Do you agree more with Thomas Hobbes and his idea that we need an absolute ruler, that the ruler should have absolute power because if you leave it up to people, they're too selfish and wicked to care about the interests of the group and therefore they'll look after themselves and they'll create problems. And therefore we need only one person with absolute power. Or do you agree with John Locke and his view that we are by nature good and we could learn from our mistakes that it's society that corrupts us but in a well um, educated society for example we can manage to govern ourselves and rule ourselves and have rights that we must all protect and have people give the ideas for government not just one ruler but a collective of people so i want you to think about which of those two you agree with and as you read the documents you know you're looking for evidence you're looking for how they wrote this we get information as historians by looking at documents in the past and reading these ideas right they didn't write them in a way that a 10th grade student at Southwest High School in the year 2020 is going to understand they wrote these documents for fellow philosophers back in the 16 and 1700s so the language is going to be very difficult and we're going to go through a strategy to hopefully make this a little bit easier and show you how to start reading through historical documents. So by the end of this lesson, I want you to be able to analyze a primary source document to determine the main ideas by annotating a reading, answering questions based on these documents, and completing what is called a hippos chart. So that is the goal. So a primary source document is a document that was written at the time period it comes from the time period you are studying so we use a strategy to try to figure out what someone says and that's called hippos because everybody who writes just like you if i were to tell you to write about something that happened your freshman year if i were to tell you write me the story of your freshman year you would all have different stories and if I, as an adult, were trying to find out what a ninth grader goes through, and I read five different stories and they were all different, well, I would have to then, you know, figure out how to kind of come up with the picture myself since you're all telling me different things. So one of the things we look at is historical context, and that's the letter H. What was happening at the time you were writing? Who is the intended audience? Who was the document written for? And does that matter? So if I were to tell you to tell me the story of your freshman year versus your parent asked you to write about your freshman year or if your best friend asked you to write about your freshman year, would all these accounts be the same? Would you write the exact same thing to me that I'm going to read that you would write to your parent or that you would write to your best friend? Would you write the things you write to your best friend would you write that to me would you let me see what you're going to tell them and chances are depending on who you're writing for you're going to leave out some information or you're going to change the tone of your of your writing so when we look at documents we have to think okay well who was this intended for if i am a politician and i'm writing a speech to give to the country versus i'm writing a letter to my wife about what happened I'm probably going to be more honest with my wife. And when I speak to the country, I might not tell everything. You know, you know, I might not admit I don't know what I'm doing, for example. But I might write a letter to my wife telling her how frustrated I am because I can't figure a problem out. So the intended audience is taken into account when we read documents to try to figure out, well, what, my, what else is missing? What else do I need to find? Then the two Ps. One stands for the purpose. Why was it written? And the other P is... What's the point of view of the speaker? Is it is the person educated? Are they male? Are they female? What social class are they from? Right? What impacted their views? Would Thomas Jefferson's best friend, 
who read the Declaration of Independence when Thomas Jefferson said, all men are created equal. Would his best friend be critical? Would he say, oh my God, Thomas Jefferson, how can you, that's not true, you don't believe that. Or would they agree? Versus, what if one of Thomas Jefferson's slaves, because he owned slaves, what if they read that? Would they be like, oh my God, Thomas Jefferson, right on, I agree. Or would they be like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. It's easy for you to say all men are critical equal equal because you're not a slave, but you don't treat me that way. And so you see the point of view shapes the way you see the world. So we need to know who the author was. When, we're, when we read documents like we're going to read about people who have different points of views, learning a little bit about what that person has gone through helps us understand why they have different points of views. So we analyze this. And then outside information just means what else do you know? What other information do you have that can help you figure this document out? And then finally, in the S box of a HIPPO's chart, you're going to write what the document's about. This is where you'll take notes on the document, where you'll write the things the author is saying. So the H, the I, the two P's, and the O are all just critical thinking strategies to try to look at the document from an analytical perspective. And then the S is, okay, here's what the document's about. So we're going to practice with two documents. And one of them is a little excerpt from Thomas Hobbes. And we're not going to read the, read the whole thing because the writing is very complex here. But I'm going to go over the strategy quickly, and then I'm going to model it more in depth with another document. So the first thing I want to do is I just want to make a prediction. What do I think based on the title? And the title says, An English Justification of Absolutism. Well, I already know that Hobbes wrote this and he believed in absolute power, absolute monarchy. So that's probably what absolutism is. And I know he's from England, so he's English. And I know the word justification, or I think the word justification means to give an excuse or a reason. Because when I used to miss school, the school would ask me to justify my absence. Justificar la falta. So justificación, justification, means to give a reason. So then I'm going to circle words I don't know. I'm going to skim it with my finger and I'm going to find words that are new to me, like confer, therein, consent, concord. Right? So these are words. And then as I read, I'm going to underline important ideas. And so if I read the first line, and I'm saying, okay, the only way to erect such a common power as may be able to defend man from the invasion of foreigners and their injuries to one another is to confer all their power and strength upon one man. Okay, so uh, I don't know what it's saying because it's so complex. Look at this. I've read one line, and it's already hard to understand. But I think it talks about power, so I'm going to underline that because I think that's going to be the something that's important. The strength of one man. So then you, what you do is you paraphrase this, and then when you're taking notes on a document, you'll paraphrase this in the margin. Right. So in the margin, you'll write, okay, what does it mean? So I have to figure out what it means. Okay. And I'm going to, like I said, I'm going to go fast to this one. So what he's saying here is that people give the power to one person for protection of something. So when you get a document like this that has a lot of very hard vocabulary, you've got to take it like one phrase at a time. And you've got to look up words. And so when I do give you documents, I'm not going to give you like the whole like two pages of what these philosophers are saying. I'm going to give you like one paragraph or two because the writing is so difficult but I want you to learn to figure it out. So we take it piece by piece. The only way to erect, to raise such a common power as may be able to defend man from the invasion of foreigners, in other words, the only way to create the power that is needed to defend people from an invasion and the injuries of one another. So. The only way that we can create the power that is going to protect people from either foreign invasion or from them hurting each other 
is to confer, right, to give all their power and strength upon one man in those things which concern the common peace and safety. And so in other words, what, he's, what he is saying here is that the only way to create the power that need, is needed to create safety and peace is to for people to give up all their power and their strength to one man, only one person, to have control so that that person can have enough power to create safety and peace. Right, so that's so that's why he supports absolutism, and so now the questions, right? Who's the source, and what do you know about him? Well, you've read Thomas Hobbes, is an English philosopher that lived through the English Civil War, right? So he lived through a time period where he saw his fellow countrymen killing each other, family against family over religion, and so the context here: where is the author from, and what was going on? That's also part of the context, right? He's writing this at a time of destruction and chaos and fighting in England. And that's where he's from. So he has seen this. And maybe that's why he doesn't trust people. Because people that had different opinions, in this case, they had different opinions about religion and about the power a government should have, that they didn't agree with each other, that they went to war and started killing each other over the ideas. So he doesn't think man could be trusted to govern themselves because everyone is selfish and has their own opinions. So, and then when you when you read something closely, you're going to look for reasons, right? So what specific reason does the author give for justifying the rule by an absolute monarch? He gives the reason that they need to provide safety and prevent injury, right? So you would cite evidence from the document. So let's try this with another document. And this time we're going to look at a document from John Locke. And again, I'm going to make my prediction. What is John Locke's second treatise on government? So I don't know what a treatise is, so I look it up, and then I find out it has to do with like a political discussion. And so it's his second one. So he's just talking about government. So this is part of a discussion on government, so I'm going to assume, I'm going to make a prediction that John Locke is going to talk about his ideas of government. I'm going to circle my new words. I skim through, and there's words like obliges, independent, ought, estate, subjected, political, whosoever, exceeds. Okay? And so these are the words that I might want to look up. So then, let's say you look them up and you just look them up on your phone or, or on your laptop. That's the great thing about having technology. You just type in Google, define, and the word, and right away, it gives, you know, you know, it gives you a simple definition you could work with to get past the obstacle of not understanding a word. There are also apps that will read stuff to you. that you'll, You could input it and it'll convert the text to speech and then you could have it read it aloud to you. So let's take a look at this document, this first phrase. The state of nature has a law of nature to govern it, which obliges everyone. So what is the state of nature? That means the natural state. So what is our natural state? Well, think about when you talk about your appearance. When you wake up in the morning, you're in your natural state. You look the way you naturally look, right? You don't have makeup. You haven't done your hair. So that's what natural means, right? What's your natural eye color? What's your natural hair, right? So it means what were you born with? So the state of nature, the state of being, you know, of the naturalness of something has a law of nature. In other words, that natural things are governed by laws like gravity, right? Things happen for a reason. We get old, we grow for a reason. There's a law that governs it, right? Nobody is born and then they just stay young forever. And so then it says, so everything has laws which obliges everyone. In other words, these apply to everybody. Everyone is born naturally and we have these things that govern all of us naturally. And reasons, right? So and reason is another one, right? So in other words, the state of nature has laws and it also has reason. 
which is that law teaches all mankind. That being all equal and independent, no one ought to harm another in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. So in other words, by nature, we are all born with natural laws. But we're also born with reason. And this teaches us that if we are all equal, and if we are all free or independent, that nobody ought to, in other words, nobody should harm another person in his life, health, liberty, or possessions. In other words, everybody, by nature, we are born with the right to not be harmed by someone else. That nobody should have the right to take away our life, our health, our liberty, or our possessions, our stuff. So these are the natural rights that John Locke talks about, life, liberty, and property. right? That we are all born with these rights and nobody could take them away. Men, being as has been said, by nature free, equal, and independent. In other words, we are by nature free. So John Locke believes, like he has said here, that we are by nature free. We are born free, we are born equal, and we are born independent. No one can put out of this estate and subject it to political power of another without his own consent. In other words, nobody can remove you from the state of nature. Nobody could take away your, your freedom or your equality or your independence and put you under the rule of somebody else without your own consent. In other words, you have to consent to be governed. You have to approve of a law being followed. In other words, you're free, but then you give up some of that freedom by your own free will. And remember, like, you know, let's say I have the freedom to, I want to walk around and whack people with the stick. But now someone says, no, you can't do that. And they make a law that I can't walk around hitting people with the stick. Is that taking away my freedom? Is that taking away my independence? Well, it's done to protect other people. And I will give it up because I know that if I can't walk around and hit people with the stick, other people can't do the same thing to me. So therefore, I agree to give up that right. I, I agree to control my behavior. Right? I am consenting. I am giving my permission. So consent, that's permission. Which is done by agreeing with other men and join and unite into a community for their comfortable, safe, and peaceable living. So in other words, how do we do this? How do we give up our rights? How do we give up our consent? We do this by agreeing with other men. In other words, we form a government by agreeing with other people that we're going to join and unite a community, that we want to be comfortable, safe, and peace, and peaceable, right? We want to live in peace. We want to be comfortable and safe. Therefore, we're all going to give up some of our freedoms so that the whole community is safe. And that means my freedom to take whatever I want or to treat people how I want, I have to control it. And then the last part of that says... Where law ends, tyranny begins. In other words, when we don't have any laws, that's when somebody begins abusive. If there's no laws, and these laws are not based on reason, then it's easy for someone to do whatever they want, and that's called tyranny. So I hope this is making sense. You know, you're, We're just looking at how John Locke wrote the ideas you already read about. So you should already be familiar with these ideas of natural rights and the consent of the governed. Okay? And then the last part of that document says, if the law be transgressed to another's harm, and if whosoever in authority exceeds the power given to him by law, may he be opposed as any other man who by force invades the right of another. So here now he's giving a consequence. So think back to when you were on an island and you wrote laws that everyone on that island should live by. But you also came up with consequences. What happens if you don't follow those rules? Okay? So that's what this is. This is kind of like saying the consequence. So the word transgression is an act that goes against the law. So if the law is broken to another's harm, in other words, if somebody breaks the law and it harms somebody else, 
And if whosoever in authority exceeds the power given him, in other words, whoever is in power, if the person who is in charge, if the person in government abuses their power, takes more power than we have given that person, then hopefully the people will oppose that ruler or any man who by force invades the right of another. In other words, that we have the right as people to go against the government if the government becomes abusive to its own authority. That if the government begins to take steps that are abusive to people, that we should have the right to oppose the government. We should not accept it or put up with it. So put this into the context, for example, of the protests that you might have been seeing. People are out on the street opposing police treatment in some communities, right? We give up our freedom. We give up our rights to the police. We give over our freedom so that the police could provide protection. So we expect the police to protect us. But if the police abuse their power, and so some people saw that the police abuse their power with how they treat certain individuals, the people then took to the streets to oppose that authority. So what you're seeing when you see protests against police brutality is you are seeing people exercise this idea that John Locke says we should do, which is to oppose a government if it becomes excessive of its power. So we we can debate that in class if you guys want you know discuss that a little bit more. I'm not, I'm not telling you to believe one side or another about these protests, but I'm giving you an example of how that looks in real life, how opposing authority looks in real life, and that's what we're seeing with the protests. And so to answer those questions, right, who was the source? What do you know about him? Where is he from? So you use all the information you learned to kind of figure out, well, why would John Locke say this, and why does he have a different view? Did he live at a different time than Thomas Hobbes? Did he come from a different social class to make him think a certain way? So those are the types of questions you should be able to answer. So now your assignment you know, for watching this presentation, I want you in the comment section of this post in Google Classroom to write a short paragraph explaining whose ideas you most agree with. So based on what these two documents that we just said, so you can go back to the presentation, you could pause it, you can copy things word for word to use as your quote. But I just want you to explain which of these two do you agree with and why? And you might agree with both. You, know, you might agree with a little bit of this guy, a little bit of that guy. Just choose something and tell me who you agree with and why. And when you write about why, I want you to use evidence from one of the documents. So I want you to use their words. You know, I agree when John Locke or when Thomas Hobbes said, and then you quote it. And then you explain why you agree with that. So that is how you're going to prove you watch this video. And that is how you're going to get points for this assignment. So I hope this was helpful. Um, if you you know, you can watch this video again if you need help. You can play it slow on YouTube. You could slow it down if I'm going too fast. All right. So that's it for this lesson. Thank you.